Hello, this is Eric Mus Barnes, and this is my very first novel, which was published in 1997 and is entitled The Gothic Rainbow. It is a vampire book, which is a part of a duology called The Vampire Noctuaries, and the sequel is Anun's Maelstrom Festival. Now, rather than tell you what this book is about, I'll tell you what the book is not about. There are no warring vampire clans in this book. There are no vampire hunters out to destroy the vampires. And there's no one who's searching for the oldest and most powerful of all the vampires. None of those sort of cliches are in this story. Let me read a little bit of it to you. But very quickly, before we get into that, I wanted to let you know that the book is available in whatever format you prefer. You can get it as a nice, big, heavy, robust hardcover. You can get it as a traditional paperback book. You can also get it as an electronic ebook. Download it for your Kindle, or your iPad, or your Barnes & Noble Nook. Whatever format you prefer for reading an ebook, they're all available simply by going to the website listed on the bottom of the page. Now, no matter which form you get, whether it's paper or electronic, in the back of the book, there are a bunch of images for a poster catalog. And if you go to the website, you'll find a link that says buy posters. You can actually purchase any of these images in almost any size from small little postcards on up to great big movie posters. If you have the book on an electronic device that's full color, such as a Kindle Fire, the poster catalog is also in full color. The whole point of these images isn't to show specific scenes in the book. That's not what they're intended to reflect. Rather, they show the vibe and the spirit and the emotional context of the story. Now, here is a sample of one of the chapters. Haley was sitting on the floor in her living room. The lights were out and she was home all alone. A tape of Cure videos cast eerily glowing splashes of illumination across the room, light and shadow to match the songs. All the faces, all the voices blur, her hands gingerly clutched a mug of hot tea, spiked with vodka. She sipped and set down her drink. Wearing black leotards and an oversized machine gray sweater, she practically blended into the room, her body threatening to become as lost in the grimness as her mind. Music and mood clouded the house in unseen mists, the air smelled like sadness, dreams a wall around herself. Her bottom lip shivered violently. A hand coated her black hair, stopped and clutched a handful as her eyes shut. Haley's sobbing came on hard and without warning. She hunched over and blinked once, tightly, clenched a jaw, quick, hiccuped gulps of air before she sat back up, forcing back the tears with a deep, spittle-sounding breath. She wiped her eyes with the heels of her palms. Her mouth still quivered, eyes still dazed. Motionless, she stared at the video for a while, but I doubt she really watched anything. Her breathing was difficult, calculated, like each breath was pained and near to her last. Poor, lost siren. Depression terrifically coated every room, filling them and splashing into every recess. Everything seemed to be colored sea gray in sorrow, a shadowy jest of whispered secrets and a lightless reflection. I stood not inches away. During the past weeks, I had become quite fond of her, of my evenings spent with this pawn, delighted in watching her saunter through the sullen atmosphere she created. 
cherished her delicate movements, so many sights and sounds, the lash of her heather petal eyes, her eyes so open to the dark. Even the sound of her shuffling from carpet to linoleum, that tick, tick, tick as her bare feet stepped across the kitchen floor, taste of tears saved on a pillowcase, the arc of a cheek, the locked curve of a wrist, the soft swish of the leather pointers sliding over the letters every night. Night after night, she lay alone in bed. Tears saturated her expressionless face. She did, she, she slid. <laughs> I was doing so well. <laughs> she slid a diary and pen off the coffee table. She sniffled and uncapped the pen. She did it with the slowest melancholy, as if it were something dangerous, something that intimidated her and was best handled gently. The glue on the spine of the diary cracked as she eased it open to a blank page, slightly squinting to see with mournfully dim television light, she began to write. Light seems bright and glares on white walls. No darkness, no light, beginning with a sound. A frightful melody plays deeply distant, gaining less ethereal substance, distantly forth from far reaches of the mind. Indescribable music, reaching unsettling harmonies no instrument could ever attain, composed by the very elements themselves, by black of evening in pasture and grove, by things which changed flavors of ember and broom, mortifying and unshakable sounds, disturbing to the very core of one's essence, distortions vaguely resembling her hypnotic recollections of World's Edge by Steve Roach, as beat of desire there lingers that disquieting music hardly audible and amorphous, slowly taking form, deceptively seeming to solidify, only to dissipate obscurely once more, much as cavern echoes resounding, noises never before known, permeating, enveloping, shrouding, suffocating every moment in intangibility. Every breath, of air scented of mud. The little girl in the car is staring into the woods, peering through her angled reflection set somewhere far within the window glass. She hears no music but would sense a change in silence were it gone. Patterns of scrolling trees turn mesmerizing, fluttering behind her reflection in mimic of thunderstorm and lightning sprites. The fireflies seem to be flashing in unison to songs the girl cannot imagine. Something feels funny, something feels wrong. The fireflies look frightening. The girl screams as the man jerks violently on the steering wheel to avoid hitting the thing in the road. Skidding out of control, their car bashes violently into a roadside ditch. Dirt chortles flying airborne shoveled upward by the front bumper slamming the embankment. Tired and bruised headlights weakly illuminate the mud, light trickling over some reeds, shadows like prison bars. A fraction of the light seeps over the embankment, out into the woods, woods that seem to resent the light, to hate it. Still the unheard music plays. Are you okay? the man asks both passengers. Dazed, the woman manages to say, yes, although sounding shaken. The girl nods, but she is hardly aware of what has even happened, and she makes not a sound. She is staring into the woods, transfixed. Are you all right? the woman yells to the girl. Turning to face her, she hadn't seen the girl nod. No answer. Honey, she's okay. Scared, the woman repeats. Are you? Huh? 
the little girl looks graven, answering not the woman, but rather another voice, not upset by the crash, terrified by something else, another voice. And suddenly, it is as if she forgets about it completely. Fear so overpowering, it vanishes with no trace. Instantly, she smiles. Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. The woman looks to the man. What the hell was that? A cow? I don't know, the man says. But it has a vague and horrid familiarity about it. Part of him almost thinks he knows what it was. As though the thing had been there before, awaited them on other nights. <laughs> but no. Turning off the engine, he tries to open the car door. Stuck by their askew angle, he pushes harder twice more. A final small shove through stubborn mud and he opens it. Wait here. But wait, the man steps out. Whatever the thing had been, it was big. It took up the whole road. No cow was ever that big. Climbing out of the ditch, he thinks, no, it wasn't a cow. It looked almost like a giant slug, the man muses. Then he stops. Somehow, that doesn't seem so funny as he walks nearer to it. Grudgingly, his pace slows. He suddenly wishes he hadn't shut off the car's engine. Only for a familiar noise in utter silence. Not even a hush of wind blows. The car passed it in the crash. Now the taillights of the ditch-lodged vehicle give the road an eerie red glow an evil glow, and the glow falls upon the thing in the road, a glow. The girl watches the man out of the rear window. The dark shadow in the road seems to breathe, up and down, as the man nears it, breathing. The girl hears the passenger door click and sees the woman getting out. No, stay there. It'll be okay, sweetie, honest. Now stay put. The woman orders and shuts the door with an intimidating stare before the girl can object any further. With that, the girl is left alone in the car. Cold with fright, she aches for the light of day, when window reflections look so different. For even the light of the city, just not the light in the reeds, not the light of the fireflies, just the day where they cannot glow. No one can turn off the music. Turn off the music they glow to. What is it? The woman whispers. Don't know, the man says, still unwilling to get too close. In his mind, he pleads that the woman not say his name. No, please. He doesn't want the thing to hear his name. Get back in the car. Fine, let's go. The thing in the road is moving a little. It seems to be breathing. Just a little. A little. Why must certain things never be aware of one's name? We should try to move it. To wake it up so nobody hits it. Wake it up? Yeah. But what is it? Part of him expects it to rear some ugly head he doesn't even know it has, then drag him to some horrid fate. He shouldn't be letting his shadow be cast upon that thing, his shadow swimming in blood-tinted light. No, he mustn't let his shadow touch it. It will know him then. The man fidgets, moving back two steps. For some reason he's scared, not because of the crash into the ditch, being stranded, and this thing. No, and it is something else. He feels like a boy again, a child afraid of cellar dark, a child afraid to look at the crack of his closet door as he falls asleep, because it moves like breathing. Breathing the imperceptible ringing of silence and static of blackness. This time, most especially of all, a child afraid to look at the woods in the night a boy. He knows there is no way he should ever
turn around again. Never dare. They wait, he thinks. Back in the car, the girl thinks she hears something in the woods. It is like a voice. A voice. She doesn't want to turn around. If she looks through the front windshield, she'll see something terrible in those woods. Something too close. Something old. Horribly, horribly old. She knows the fireflies will be something else then. She can feel them watching her. Feel what they really are. How they feel. Feel each time one lights up like a pinprick on the back of her neck. Needles. Needles in her neck, making needle shadows of reeds, lighting the breathing mud. Slugs are breathing. She tries to close her eyes. The bass of music she cannot hear makes her heart skip, makes her ears ring. Tears run from her shut eyes, tears turned to saltily dance upon her lips. She clenches her fists over her ringing ears. She tries to scream. She tries and she tries, but it is too loud for her to imagine her cries. The girl opens her eyes, hoping to see the woman in the gory red tail lamp light, praying for a familiar comfort in, but the only light the girl sees is seeping into the woods, out the front windshield. Tired and bruised light over the embankment, the horribly old things she sees in the woods. The woods seems to hate the light, to hate her, hate. The woman runs back to the car as she hears the girl screaming. The man follows close behind, dare not look, he dare not. Shouting for the girl, the woman tears the car door open. The child is gone. She should not be shouting so loud. You might make it mad. And madness mad. Music vanishes. To sense a change in the silence is deafening, ringing. The woman yells the girl's name to the darkness three times before she notices the man is staring blankly into the woods. You yelled? You yelled at the darkness? Oh no, no, how could you? He looks like a little boy, transfixed, captive by fear of the crack around his closet door, afraid, so very. The woman follows his gaze. Headlights illuminate the woods like gray rib bones of a million dead souls stretching into infinity, totems of tribes with no past. Off in the furthest distance, straining at the very edge of their ability to see, crucified upon a bony tree. Fireflies dance around the dusty gray skeleton of a young girl, and the firefly light seems hate. And the firefly light seems to hate her. It seems to hate them all. I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video, and be sure to check out some of my other books as well.